What if I told you that in the 1800s there existed a madman that in his 20s was a school teacher in Mississippi, a land surveyor, and the leader of the local militia? Then he moved to Texas and was the official surveyor for Stephen F. Austin's first colony. Then he started Texas' most important newspaper during the Revolution and had to go on the run from the Mexicans with his printing press after the massacre at the Alamo. Then he was the city planner for Houston and Galveston. Then he was appointed to be the official port collector at Galveston by Texas's first president, Sam Houston. In this job, he was responsible for 50% of the Republic of Texas revenue. Then he facilitated the sale of over 2,500 lots of land to the first settlers of Galveston. Then, in his mid-40s, he dropped everything to start a wet and wild inventing career. Literally wet. One night he wanted to test out this weird uh, like half land, half water vehicle he made, and he ended up driving a wagon full of his dinner guests into the ocean against their will. Then, after tons of failures, in his late 50s, he finally invented something useful that changed the food industry forever. What if I told you all that? You probably believe me. I mean, it's not really all that insane, I guess. Hey folks, it is Gail Borden time. Ever think you would uh, hear those words in a sentence? I certainly didn't. So I want to start with kind of a bizarre story of a midnight dinner party that Gail Borden apparently threw that went a little haywire. So I guess first, how I came across this guy in the first place. So one day I was just thinking about Elmer's Glue for some reason. And so I Googled Elmer's Glue founder. And this guy came up, Gail Borden. And it turns out he's not even the founder of Elmer's Glue. It was invented well after he was dead, but it was the remnant of the company he founded that made Elmer's Glue. So for some reason, his name still came up as Elmer's Glue founder. And I did a little more digging and started to uncover all this stuff he did. And, and I had no idea this guy existed. And then I was thinking, like, why was I even thinking of Elmer's glue in the first place? And I couldn't remember. So I figured it was some sort of uh, destiny slash fate situation that we had to do a episode on this guy. So anyways, yeah, in his older age, he's kind of becomes this wild inventor type guy. And that's where the story of this 1847 dinner party comes in. So this wasn't just a normal dinner party. Gail Borden had a bit of an agenda. He had at least two inventions he wanted to test out on his guests. He, uh, during the party, he kind of forced all his guests to try this uh, weird like meat byproduct paste he had been working on. It wasn't what turned out to be Elmer's glue, was it? No. <laughs> it sounds like it's kind of what turned out to be hot dogs. Whoa! I mean, I don't, I don't think directly at all, but just in the sense that this was, uh, it was like made out of stuff you'd throw away. I mean, it was like just byproducts. So it was made out of the stuff the butcher would throw away or whatever. Mm -hmm. So he had, he reportedly said something like, "If you knew, if you knew what was in this, you would be repulsed or something." <laughs> so the guests kind of tried it, but wasn't good at all. He tried to keep from vomiting. One of those dinner parties, but. Kind of the main story from this party. So after dinner, he invites everyone out back to his workshop to show off this uh, machine he's been working on. It's a, a half land, half water vehicle he's trying to invent. So the goal, it's like a carriage, but he calls it the Terraqueous machine. And it's not uh, horse drawn or, you know, engine, of course, 1847, but it's sail, wind driven. The guests are kind of curious about this and he, uh, they go out to the beach and a bunch of them hop in it, apparently, you know, want to test it out. So he raises the sail, and it starts going pretty fast across the beach. And they say Gail Borden steered it 
uh, right into the water and the people didn't know he was going to. <laughs> so he steers it and they, they kind of start to, start to panic and instinctively, instinctively everyone on it, you know, kind of lunges towards the landward side of the carriage because they'd just gone in the water and apparently that made it capsize or <laughs> so everyone's in the water and everyone makes it to shore and they they're all accounted for except for Gail Borden and they realized Gail Borden was still out in the ocean riding the capsized hull of the machine and they called to him asking if he could make it to shore and he reportedly said I don't want to make it it can't sink and he yelled at him there was no danger why did you make such fools of yourselves? Good captain goes down with the ship. It's like there's no reason to panic. It was working fine. So one story worth telling from his 30s, I guess, in this early Texas era, is he actually founded a newspaper that came to be one of the most important like sources of information during the Texas Revolution. And at one point, after uh, the Alamo where the Mexican forces overtook the Texans and like killed everyone inside the Alamo. So after this, all the civilian Texans are scared and they're all fleeing east to try to stay away from the Mexican forces that are coming. And Gail Borden's running this newspaper, which is important to get like news about the war out and stuff. And he doesn't want to just shut down the paper. So what they do is they disassemble the printing press and pack it up and take it on the run to try to get out ahead of the Mexicans and, and keep printing. But the Mexicans catch up to him and kind of catch him in the act of printing an issue. Uh, they, they certainly took issue uh, with the issues that Gail Borden's newspaper was printing. They arrest him and the guys working on the paper and throw... The printing press, which is really expensive, they throw all that into the uh, Buffalo Bayou, which I'm, I guess I'm not exactly sure where that is. But <laughs> Sounds like a bad place to put a printing press. It's not, not where you want your printing press to end up. The bottom of the Buffalo Bayou. <laughs> so, But, I mean, it's a really expensive machine back then, especially. Puts them out of out of business for a bit. So that I mean, they're arrested, but the revolution ended shortly after that. So I don't think they were held held very long by the Mexicans. So, anyways, I thought that was kind of a cool story. But flash forward in his mid forties, he's already done a ton of different things in his life and been involved in these high levels of of early Texas. And at this point, he kind of transitions, and it seems he wants to work on his own ideas and try to get one of his inventions to take off, which takes him a while. And there's a lot of failures along the way. So a couple failures of note were, one was like a giant refrigerator he wanted to invent because uh, his wife had died of yellow fever in 1844. And apparently that was a big problem at the time. But yellow fever would recede with the first frost. So he wanted to develop a giant refrigerator to put people in to simulate a frost or something. And I'm not quite sure how far along this got, but uh, that didn't go anywhere. Another one was a locomotive bathhouse. So women back then were much more reserved and kind of shy about uh, swimming or bathing in the Gulf of Mexico at Galveston. So this idea was something and I'm not quite sure what it was, but something that you would like put in the water or something that would allow women to go to the beach in private. I don't know exactly what this one was. Anyways, point is it was a failure, but he never gave up. And at some point in here, he kind of becomes obsessed with uh, condensing food. One quote from him is, I mean to put a potato in a pillbox, a pumpkin into a tablespoon, the biggest sort of watermelon into a saucer. Pretty normal guy, I do one weird thing. I'm just obsessed with condensing foods. I just love condensing foods. He wanted to invent something that would be practical for, you know, soldiers, settlers, sailors, people who could use lightweight but calorie 
rich rations, basically. And one of his first ideas along this front was something he called the meat biscuit. It was concocted of beef broth evaporated into syrup, mixed with flour, and kneaded into dough. The resulting morsel was formed into cakes that could be fried or baked. So this meat biscuit, he thought he had like struck it, struck gold with this. He had a lot of pretty good feedback. You know, I think it tasted a little better than whatever he served at that dinner party. Um, he sold a bunch to the army and he won some gold medal or, or big award at the London's World Fair for it. Hmm. Whatever it was up for, it beat out like the Colt revolver. Whoa. So he had, about at this time, he had built up a net worth of uh, $3 million in today's term. Wow. In today's term, so whatever, whatever that was. And he used, it says, he used all of it. He went all in on the meat biscuits idea. <laughs> he, uh, he built, uh, you know, built a factory and was prepared to ramp up production and all that. But while he was in London at this World Fair, he heard some bad news from the army that they would not be ordering any more of these meat biscuits because uh, the army deemed it, quote, not only unpalatable, but it failed to appease the cravings of hunger, producing headache, nausea, and great muscular depression. So in practicality, it became... uh, I think very unappetizing. Feedback from multiple people said they'd rather starve <laughs> than eat these meat biscuits. <laughs> that uh, was pretty much a bust after that once he didn't have the approval of the army or anything. And he filed for bankruptcy a year later in 1852. So that was a bust, but he was right on to his next idea. Very proud of all his ideas, I guess. Um, Apparently his favorite saying was, I never drop an idea except for a better one. So his next idea he moved on to was an idea he got while on the ship back from London, actually. They were serving milk that ended up being contaminated. And I think four four or so people died, probably mainly infants, but just from disease, from this milk. This kind of spurred an idea that he would condense milk, you know, going back to his obsession with condensing things so i have heard of condensed milk before that was all gail borden in 1853 the meat biscuit i knew that wasn't going to go anywhere because i haven't heard of that yeah you don't really hear about meat biscuits anymore these days but the milk idea was uh, kind of his ultimate winner so he had the idea that you would boil milk in a vacuum and also through the whole process, really reduce any contaminants that could get into the milk. He focused a lot on like the sanitation aspect. He had the barns cleaned for the cows he was using. They would clean the udders before milking and stuff like that. The real innovation apparently was boiling milk in a vacuum, which it took him three years to get patented, but he got the the specific process or, or whatever patented in 1856. And he built out a couple factories and It was received well and had a pretty good reputation stuff, but it was struggling to turn a profit. And then he just happened to sit next to a a pretty wealthy investor on a train ride once. And turns out this guy invested $100,000 in 1850s money, whatever, to become 50% owner in the condensed milk company. So that kind of helped buy him some time and get him going again. And what really made it take off was the Civil War. So they uh, came to really like this condensed milk. Sales really took off. And even after the war, the sales sustained because all these guys had developed an appetite or, you know, came to like condensed milk. So would keep buying it. Mm. And plus, there still wasn't refrigeration, you know. So it was still a practical way to, to get milk and have it for longer periods of time. So apparently it's just like at a five to one ratio so just comes in a can but it's like a really thick syrupy substance you know and then you just add five parts water to one part condensed milk and then you have something similar to milk huh. so that was his big big claim to fame died in 1874 so 73 years old 
and he wrote his own epitaph. He said, I tried and failed. I tried again and again and succeeded. Not a bad epitaph. But, so the Elmer's glue thing, this Borden company kind of expanded from just condensed milk into a full on dairy company, I guess just since they had all the dairy providers anyway. So in the 1930s, this ad agency working for this Borden company developed this character, Elsie the cow, female cow, you know, whatever, mascot type thing. And apparently at one point, 98% of Americans could, you know, knew who Elsie the cow was. Wow. Pretty big marketing. I don't think there's one person you could find today that 98% of Americans could identify. So then, eventually they added in a husband to Elsie the cow named Elmer. So they, this Borden company developed a, a glue because initially a key ingredient of the glue was like a dairy protein or something. So it kind of had to do with the dairy business, even though the glue, it's all synthetic now. This glue was popular because it dried clear and could be washed off hands and surfaces and stuff. Everything up to then was pretty permanent. And shortly after they developed it, they renamed it to Elmer's glue based on this Elmer who's the husband to Elsie. So that's why you see there's a little cow on, hmm. a little cow mascot on Elmer's glue. So in conclusion, um, as I stewed and ruminated on the life of Gail Borden, I, and not to make this all about us, but I couldn't help but draw some comparisons from his life to uh, this channel. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? And again, I hate to make this all about us, but uh, we are, and we are the ones putting in the painstaking hours to deliver these 55 folks to you. So the channel has to be about us a little bit. I couldn't help but uh, draw comparisons between Gail's, Gail uh, Borden's life and this channel because folks, the thing is, uh, just like Mr. Borden, we also will never get up. <clears throat> we also will never give up until we get to 55 folks. Uh, then who knows, maybe we will give up. But uh, rest, you can rest assured we will at least get to 55.